Hello, welcome to today's session on limiting structures in maxillary arch. There's lots to say, so let me jump right into the topic. All the structures in the oral cavity are lined by oral mucosa. Oral mucosa has two layers, the mucosa and the submucosa. Mucosa is lined by stratified squamous epithelium and it can be of three types, masticatory mucosa, lining mucosa and specialized mucosa. Lining mucosa covers the lips, cheeks, sulcus, soft palate and slopes of restal alveolar ridge and the epithelium is non-keratinized. Masticatory mucosa has keratinized epithelium, is best suited to withstand the forces of mastication and is seen in the crest of the ridge, rugae area and hard palate. Specialized mucosa is again keratinized mucosa seen in the dosum of the tongue and has the presence of teeth buds. Now coming to the submucosa which forms the second layer. The connective tissue which forms the submucosa may contain dense to loose areolar tissue, fat cells, glandular cells, muscle cells, nerves and blood vessels. The contents vary in each area. The amount of support provided by the submucosa depends on its contents the consistency and the firmness with which it is attached to underlying bone. So that was the key points related to oral mucosa. Now let's see the limiting structures that define the periphery or the boundaries of a denture. Fine? Let me first list them. They are the labial frenum, the labial vestibule, the buccal frenum, the buccal vestibule, hamilar notch, posterior palatal seal area and the fovea palatinae. Now let's see each one of them in detail. Coming to the first landmark, the labial frenum. This is a post eruptive remnant of the tectolabial bands and it is found in the midline just above the central incisors. This fibrous band is covered by mucous membrane and it extends from the labial aspect of the residual ridge to the undersurface of the lip. When we make an impression of this patient, this labial frenum gets recorded as a notch in the impression and here you can see the same label notch replicated in the denture. The notch provided in the denture should be narrow and deep enough and it shouldn't interfere with the movements of the frenum. So here we have a primary impression, a master cast, a denture and a primary cast on which the anatomical landmarks have been painted. Hope you can appreciate the presence of the label frenum and the label notch in all these pictures. One key point to remember here is the labial frenum doesn't have any muscle fibers attached to it. Hence, it's a passive frenum and doesn't have any action of its own. Now, here's a little extra info for those who might be interested. We have several types of frenum depending on its attachment. A is the mucosal frenum where the frenum is attached to the mucogingival junction. B, gingival where it is attached to the attached gingiva. We have C, the papillary frenum where it is attached to the interdental papilla between the two teeth. And last is the papillary penetrating frenum where the penetration of the papilla, uh, sorry, the uh, frenum extends all the way into the parietal papilla. Again, we can have high frenum, low frenum, wide frenum, bifid frenum, double frenum, frenum with appendix or frenum with nichium. If any of these variations is going to interfere with your complete inch of fabrication, they can be corrected either by phrenectomy, which involves complete removal of the frenum, or phrenotomy, which involves a modification of its attachment. I guess that will be enough now about our little fold of mucous membrane in the front of our mouth or labial frenum. Now let's uh, proceed on to the more active and dynamic buccal frenum. Can you see that fan-shaped folds of mucous membrane on either side? They may be single or double and is greatly influenced by the presence of certain muscle fibers in it. Do you remember the muscles at the sides of the face? Let's have a look at them. Oh, that's quite a lot of muscles there, right? Don't worry, we'll confine ourselves to just three muscles that is going to act on our little buccal frenum. I have put a small blue mark in the approximate region where our buccal frenum is going to be. So you can see there the circular muscle, the orb, around the oris, our mouth, which is going to pull the buccal frenum forwards. The buccinator, which lies deeper to levator, is going to pull it backwards. And levator anguli oris, as is evident from its name, is going to pull it upwards. So when your patient does action similar to this, these muscles and invariably the buccal frenum is going to be activated. Here you can see the buccal frenum on the primary cast and on the master cast and the buccal notch is provided in the denture. 
the notches provided in the denture should be wide and deep enough to allow unhindered movement of the frenum during such actions. Let's move on to the next landmarks, the labial and the buccal vestibule. So let's see the landmarks here. This is the labial freedom marked on this cast and we have two buccal freedoms here. Okay, so the portion between the labial freedom and the buccal freedom is called the labial sulcus. This portion marked in blue and the portion between the buccal freedom and we have a landmark here called the hamula notch. That portion between the buccal freedom and the hamula notch is called the buccal sulcus, this red portion. Similarly, on the other side also, labial sulcus and the buccal sulcus. Okay, so the portion of the denture, see we have the label freedom here and the label notch provided in the denture. We have two buccal freedoms here, two buccal notches. You can appreciate the same in this master cast. We have not marked anything here, but can you see it? We have the label freedom here, two buccal freedoms here, this sulcus, label sulcus and the buccal sulcus similarly on the other side. Now, right next to the anterior teeth, we have the lips, right? We have the lips covering here and we have the cheeks on the posterior teeth. Okay, so the depth and width of the sulcus is not constant at all times. It's highly influenced by the action of the muscles around the lips and cheeks. Okay. Now have a look at this wheel. Can you see the central portion, the hub of a wheel called the modulus, a Latin word. It's a powerful point that holds all the spokes of the wheel together. We have a similar modulus where eight muscles insert and converge at the angle of the mouth. Action of all these muscles along with the modulus significantly affects the depth and width of a labial and buccal sulcus. Width of the distal portion of the buccal sulcus is also influenced by the movement of coronary process during opening and lateral movements of the mandible. When a patient opens the mouth wide or moves the jaw from side to side, the coronary process of the mandible moves downwards and forwards, thereby affecting the width of the sulcus in that region. Uh, for identifying our next landmark, the hamula notch, let's have a look at the base of the skull. Okay, let's zoom into our subject area. Hamula notch is the depression seen between the maxillary tuberosity and the pterygoid hamulus. Can you see that hook-like process at the extremity of the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone? Did you get that? See, behind the last molar, the bulbous bony projection is called the maxillary tuberosity and just behind it is the depression we are talking about. The maxillary denture should extend only up to the hamula notch. If the denture extends beyond the hamula notch onto the pterygoid hamulus, you can see that it's sharp and spiny and is covered by very thin mucous membrane. Also, the pterygomandibular raphe is attached to this hamulus. So the maxillary denture should extend only up to the hamula notch. If it extends beyond onto the pterygoid hamulus, it's going to cause a lot of pain, soreness, discomfort, instability and even looseness of the denture when this raphe gets pulled or stretched during mouth opening. Now coming to the most important, the most loved and hated landmark, yes, the posterior parietal seal area. By definition, it is a soft tissue along the junction of hard and soft palate on which pressure within the physiological limits can be applied by a complete denture to aid in its retention. The posterior palatal seal area can be divided into two regions, the pterygomaxillary seal and the postpalatal seal. The pterygomaxillary seal starts at the hamula notch and it extends 3 to 4 millimeters anterior laterally into the mucogingival junction. So that was the first part, the pterygomaxillary seal. Now let's see the second part, the postpalatal seal area. This posterior palatal seal area is not a line, a straight line as seen here, but has the shape of a bow and is also lovingly called the Cupid's bow after Cupid, the son of Venus, the Greek god of love. You can see the cupid's bow here on our cast. It has two lines. The curved line in front is called the anterior vibrating line and the straight line behind is called the posterior vibrating line. To look into that, we'll have to go back to our anatomy and our base of the skull. The highlighted area is the hard palate and just behind it, we have the soft palate. At the beginning of the soft palate, we have a dense fibrous lamella called the palatine epidurosis formed by tensor veli palatine and the levator veli palatine muscles. Uh, this area has limited movement and can be called the immobile part of the soft palate. Beyond this area, we have a 
highly mobile part of the soft palate which is under the influence of soft palate muscles hope it's fine so far now our anterior vibrating line is at the junction of hard palate and immobile part of the soft palate it always lies in the beginning of the soft palate and the distinct shape see that spike in the center is caused by the attachment of the tissue to the underlying posterior nasal spine i have often heard this question being asked in exams and very few answer this so now you know right also let me get this straight see there is no line drawn as such in the patient's mouth and uh, i know we don't have x-ray vision to know where the heart palate ends but there's a technique called valsalva maneuver named after the italian physician antonio valsalva to determine this uh, the technique is you can try it on yourselves too check out yourselves in the mirror pinch both nose nostrils shut and then ask the patient to gently blow through the nose you can distinctly see the soft palate flexing at the area called the anterior vibrating line i hope i have the time to say this see during fine year clinical exams we often see around 20 students and their patients all enthusiastically doing this over and over again and that too too vigorously in the hope i think that the special tray bottom hold and special tray sticks to the maxilla or what the whole scene looks like a shaolin temple acrobatics or some like some mass yoga pranayama session see this valsalva technique has a lot of effect on the autonomic nervous system the middle ear it can raise the middle ear pressure either it can raise the pressure in the thoracic cavity it was initially used as a treatment for rapid heartbeat tachycardia to bring down the heartbeat it can raise and decrease blood pressure so if your patient is has any of these problems some middle ear infection or respiratory infection that can put they will get can get pushed into the eustachian tube or any underlying heart disease or heart problems then there is going to be some problem so just once or twice we'll do the trick okay so next is the posterior vibrating line again this is an imaginary line between two hamla notches that is it extends from one hamla notch to the other and also its junction between the immobile and mobile part of the soft palate it's uh, recorded by asking the patient to say ah in short bursts for the remaining story on posterior palate seed area please wait until we deal with the bottom molding and impressions so now moving on to the last landmark here fovea palatinae Uh, see there are several minor mucus glands in the palate the ducts of these glands merge together and they open out as two small openings on either side of the midline there's a lot of confusion regarding the position of fovea it varies in different ethnic races uh, but for now let's stick on to the fact that your denture can extend 2 mm beyond the fovea so fovea can be used as an arbitrary guideline in determining the posterior extent of your denture With that we wind up this topic. I hope you found the session to be fruitful. My special thanks to all who gave me a feedback about this new venture of mine. It means a lot to me. I'll be back soon with my next video on supporting structures in maxillary arch. Until then, take care.